Welcome back to the Cash in Common podcast. You know, we are getting started here again. This is episode number two. I'm Ryan, the property lawyer. This is Roberto Palaccia. I don't know if you would want to go with anything else now on socials and what you're thinking yeah, there. Yeah, so I'm But Roberto... uh, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, there, yeah, you know? yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, man. Uh, I'm I'm Roberto Palaccia. I'm a mortgage broker. <laughs> mortgage brochure. <laughs> let me start that one again. I'm a mortgage broker. Uh, I'm a certified cash flow specialist, and I'm also a Smith Maneuver accredited professional. And uh, I focus on helping people take control and... Uh, basically master their cash flow and conquer their mortgage for a better life right now. Yeah. You know, that's we, that's sort of my goal. That's amazing, right? And that's where we you sort of started this podcast because, you know, in part, largely so that we can educate people on that piece. Uh, me on, on the real estate law side, kind of give an insight as to some of the implications there. I also have lots of questions. I want to know how to build more wealth through using my mortgage, you know, whatever mechanisms that are good. From a financial perspective, Rob's the cash flow expert, so we, you know, we sort of, uh, you know, see a lot of synergies there, and that's why we started this thing. We want to share this with the world, not just, but you know, with ourselves. We want to be able to give this to people in in general. It's part of the messaging, the goals, the aspirations we have. I think so. You know, today I think we're going to focus in on specifically the mortgage. Right? We'll talk about mortgages yeah. and how to build wealth using your mortgage. I don't know where you want to drill down or what topics you want to focus on. I'm going to let you just decide that, Rob, and then we can kind of see what happens, how it pans out. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, everyone has a different journey, you know, when it comes to this. Uh, everyone's in a different place, but it's something that everyone can do, right? Like everyone who has a mortgage can start utilizing it as an asset, uh, not having to think of it as a burden. Um, and And if we kind of change that mindset – what really happens is is uh, you know you start developing more income streams for yourself, mm -hmm. right? And that's how that's how wealthy people actually operate, right? They actually use debt uh, to buy assets and basically grow wealth. And it doesn't have to be <laughs> for just the elite or anything. Like any Canadian can do this. Period. End and it's story, right? So and this is that's the thing is that there's there's a misconception so there's two things right there's a misconception of how debt should not you shouldn't have debt that's, that's right. number one that's like right. a big big, big barrier. issue big barrier yeah. a big way of thinking that sort of is very prevails a prevailing view in a lot of ways and the other aspect of course is that people don't understand that there's bad and there's good debt and there's Absolutely. a right way to use debt and there's a wrong way to use debt and and so you know if you want to kind of build wealth what you know, what, what should you be thinking about with respect to debt? Which kind of debt should you have? Which kind of debt shouldn't you have? I expect we're going to sort of dive into that. Yeah, we'll right? dive into that. Absolutely. And, and I think it's important to understand that the whole idea of taking control uh, of your personal financial circumstance is really saying that without actually mastering your cash flow, you'll never really develop into a person that could conquer their mortgage. Right, because mm. it's what you hit on right now about good debt and bad debt. If you keep on incurring bad debt, then it's going to take away from the structure of what you're doing with the good debt. Right. So it's really, it's really. I think that's a really important uh, thing to say. But we're going to drill down on the mortgage side of things today. And and with mortgages, you know, um, they're not all equal. So I think you know we have to recognize that. And and the key, if you really want to start. Um, investing and growing wealth and using your mortgage as a tool to do that is you want to have a readvanceable mortgage. Okay. Right. And so what that means is that the mortgage basically opens up your equity available to you that you can reborrow now as you're actually paying it down. Right. So, so that's, that's super key in, in, uh, in building out this strategy um, as well as actually looking at the equity you have in your home now. Right. right. We've all seen a big windfall, I think, in equity in the last few years in, in our homes. So actually looking at, OK, well, my house is worth a million dollars now and my original mortgage was, you know, let's say four hundred thousand. And now I have six hundred thousand dollars in equity. You know, can I tap into that and what can I do with it? Right. And how do you so readvanceable mortgage? So what does it look like just for the, you know, the viewers, the people who don't have the savviness. I said, so we see it all the time. Right. But yeah. what, 
what is the product? What does it look like in terms of like, what are we talking about? Is it a credit card? Is it a, like, you know, is it a line? Is it a loan? Like, is it a straight ahead loan? Are you getting all that money into your pocket? How, how, how do these products work? Like, what is it? Does it what yeah, it that's a like? good question. And you know what? It's really a combination product. So you're combining a traditional mortgage with an amortization schedule, right? Like right. like a 25-year, 30-year loan. And it's being combined with a home equity line of credit. Okay. All right. So it's an actual combination. Not a separate uh, products, but an actual product that's combining the two of them. So what happens is, is let's say your mortgage payment's $2,000 a month. And... Uh, $1,000 of that is going towards a principal. So actually paying down the loan. So as you're paying down the loan, you're actually opening up credit availability on on the home equity line of credit. So $1,000 is going now towards the home equity line of credit. And month after month after month, that develops and grows. And um, it's it's important because if you want to be really efficient, it's all about timing, right? Like wealth grows over time. So as that money is coming up and being available to you, you want to draw it out and actually start putting that into uh, the market somewhere. And the market doesn't necessarily mean the stock market. I mean, there's there's all kinds of different investments that you can look at. Uh, but generally speaking, you want to uh, put it somewhere that can generate revenue. You know, that's the whole idea is you want to ha- make another income stream happen for you. Mm. Okay, interesting. So are you, <clears throat> where can you get these kinds of products? Are they everywhere? Like in terms of banks? Or is it specific that's, banks? That's a really good question. I, I would say uh, almost every major bank, you know, all the big five, uh, all yeah. have a product that um, to some way or effect is a readvanceable mortgage. They're all not made equally. That's for sure. Like uh, some, some of them are, a little more adaptable to this strategy. Right. Um, and it really pays to know more about your product. Like there's a lot of fine print. Um, when you get your mortgage, a lot of, of uh, people don't really pay attention to these points, but knowing, for example, what your pre- prepayment privileges are. So how much you're allowed to, uh, to put into the principle of your mortgage every year is super key. Um, and the availability of that. So, what I mean by that is certain lenders uh, won't let you do it whenever you want. You know, right. they, they basically have timing, uh, you know, typically once a year where you, you're allowed to kind of express this prepayment privilege and take advantage of it. Right. So you can't just pay. You can't just get a mortgage, pay that mortgage out in full because you get a windfall of money. So you win the lottery. You got, you got, you know, you've got a limit on that. Banks penalize you if you pay above certain right. amounts. Yeah, right? and they won't let you do it all <clears throat> the time, right? So just just for the record, like you could, you know, when we're talking about getting a windfall and, and paying it off, like most lenders will let you do that at, with with what you said exactly is is uh, some sort of interest penalty, right? Okay. Um, they'll calculate that, and pay it out, and there's, you know, ways of doing that. So they're still um, going to win. <laughs> yeah, they always win. Yeah, banks always win. But um, really it's about how fluid you can manage that that principle being available to you. So the more fluid that is, then uh, more opportunities to to get money out there and and earning. What do you mean by fluid? Just fluid. I, it means like you know. So for example, I'll give you actually real. Like you want to hear about real banks? And yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. You so need to hear the stories, man. So for example, like RBC. Um, and I'll say I, I own RBC stocks, so just just say <laughs> not knocking RBC, not knocking RBC. We're totally, about it. Yeah. I do own RBC stocks. Um, <clears throat> is that you know with their mortgage, it's not as good for the strategy, right? Because you can only actually prepay their mortgage by ten percent annually. All okay. right, first off, so that's usually on the smaller end. You got something on your notice there? Just grab. Yeah. There you go. Sorry. Yeah, you're good. Um, so ten percent annually, uh, which isn't much, right? And then uh, also you can't uh, do it whenever you want, right? It's basically only on an anniversary date that you can dump that 10% on there. So if you put this in practical terms, let's say um, you have a rental property. Okay. Okay, so part of, this is going to be a little 
a little more detailed, but this is, you know, really, really interesting stuff that you could do is that if you have a rental property, you can actually use the rental income and prepay your mortgage and then take it back out and create a tax deduction for yourself. Interesting. Right. So this is where like when we, 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 we actually take a basic set of of uh, uh strategies so there's a basic smith maneuver strategy okay and then when we start actually adding these accelerators is what we call them and and now actually making more advancements because that so so bringing it back to good debt and bad debt for a second yep you know good debt is where you can um use the debt to actually make an investment that generates cash flow and also creates a tax deduction for you Okay. That's very healthy debt, right? Because that debt is giving you an ROI as far as the investment's concerned. The asset could be an asset that actually grows in capital, right? Like a house. Sure. And then on top of that, you're also getting a tax deduction on your income. And that tax deduction can be against all your income, yeah. right? Oh, so okay. it's not, yeah. All your income you make off of that? O off of everything. Is. Like, you know, your job, uh, yeah. your investment portfolio, that tax deduction is also nested, okay? Like, it's not like an RSP. So for an RSP, for example... What does that mean, nested? I don't know. Yeah, so for an RSP, what do you usually have to do every year to take advantage of an RSP? Well, you got to max it out, right? Right, so you have to contribute to it contribute every year. To it, yeah. So you got to find money, your after-tax dollars, and you got to put it in there Sure. Yeah. to get that one-time hit of a tax deduction, yeah. right? Well, when we're using our mortgage in this way... If you, let's say, have $100,000 that you've used in an investment, it's generated income for you, that interest that you pay on that $100,000 becomes a tax deduction forever, as long as you have that money out there. Mm. So you don't have to re-contribute anything and find extra money to, to get that tax deduction every year. And that's like you just do whatever. So if you buy a property, this is the, you're, in your scenario, you're buying a property. Or you right. use that money to buy a property? You could do that when you get bigger chunks. Oh, is this right? this is just lending that money out, or is it how? No, no. no. Like so, for example, so so uh, let's say we have that same scenario: a million dollars, <throat> and now I have a mortgage of four hundred. Yeah. All right. So, you know, we we work with somebody, we uh, with a mortgage broker like myself, and uh, we're like, okay, well, we can actually qualify for uh, a total universal amount of six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay. So that's how that's another thing about these products, um, is that there's usually a, some sort of global limit, and that global limit, um, it will mean that you have the ability to take up to so much. So in this particular case, it would be six hundred and fifty thousand. Now, what we have established already is a mortgage, right? You owe money on the house, and it's six hundred. We're going to call that bad debt for now. Okay. Right, okay. So, it's six hundred fifty thousand because the bank's not going to do more than 80% loan to value, right? In that context, or is it, or they're just like, they set the values based on whatever. So, else? Uh, so yeah. Okay. The maximum we can ever refinance or restructure a mortgage after our purchase is 80%. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So that's a really good point. Um, and then in that 80%, we can then structure how much can be allocated so let's take, I, I like using examples because it really, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, harmonizes. Uh, it's uh, better. It's better. visualizes with people a little more. So that particular case, let's say it is $650,000. Um, if you owe 400000 already, so you're going to have, you know, a mortgage now. We can set up a regular mortgage uh, just like as, as you probably had previously set up. And that's going to be the 400000 So now, but but they have opened up up to 650. So that means there's another $250,000 that will be available to you in this home equity line of credit. Right. Okay. Okay. And as that home equity line of credit, um, sorry, as your principal and interest go, uh, sorry, your principal goes down to that regular mortgage, that $400,000, that's opening up availability into that home equity line of credit for you. Right. Okay. Okay. And so, if you wanted to buy property now, let's say you took two hundred thousand dollars of that and you put a down payment, down payment on, on purchase, else. yep, right. So that two hundred thousand dollars now is actually um, a a tax deduction for you every year. Okay, all right, because you own that property, you borrowed to earn money and to buy an asset, and 
all that income you do make on the property will be tax deductible, right? Like, or tax uh, will be taxed. So anything that you're going to be taxed on, you can have a tax deduction. You can against. offset against so exactly, yeah. right? Yeah. So that two hundred grand for every year now. that you have the two hundred every year. Out so there. you you have this house or this property you bought, you can always you know have this tax deduction there. Oh, okay. So, but if you sell the house, you lose that. Well, you sell the house. What happens is you repay it back, right? Sure. Which is probably what you're going to do anyways. That's true, yeah. Right? So whenever you capture <clears throat> capital back, like I'm getting my money back, you pay down the credit line, right? Yeah. CRAs, CRAs kind of picky about that stuff, actually. When it comes to actually implementing the strategy, um, that's the kind of thing they expect you to do, right? Sell is it. When you sell it and you're getting money back, your original money back, they expect you to repay back that. Oh, okay. So you're almost, you're better off not doing that. You're all, you're better off keeping it out there as long as you can, or as long as you need to. For sure. I mean, it you depends know, depends on it, different people's needs, I guess. Yeah, like, exactly. You know, There's always a time money. where where property could be sold for many reasons, yeah. right? Uh, you can always re-leverage it, you know. Uh, but sure. that, as long as you own it, if you took out that two hundred thousand dollars, that is a tax deduction. Okay. And yeah. and to be clear, it's the interest that you're paying on that can be a tax deduction for you forever. So if you don't have this. Um, re-advanceable mortgage now, you could switch your mortgage out, right? And get one. And like, yeah, are, if, don't, if don't most, I mean, I feel like almost all banks now are, are basically encouraging you to get it, right? Or like at least, I don't know, seems like there's a lot of them available. I think if you, it depends who you're talking to, right? Yeah. Uh, I think oh, okay, okay, the broker, that's true. The broker. Uh, I talk a lot or, to you, so that's really Yeah, right. I do encourage it a lot. You're right. Um, <laughs> Because it is such a great, a great tool, right? Um, so that's kind of speaking in the in the frame of you know buying a property, right? But then, you know, even the small little bits that are opening up to you, right? So that thousand dollars that's knocking down on your principal every month, and that continues to grow. You know, you can bring that money out and then reinvest that and bring it into uh, all different types of investments. But I try to focus on investments that actually try to pay every month right like give out some sort of distribution um typically those are investments where you're earning interest and uh you know those are great and the whole idea is that if you're really efficient at this the mortgage your bad mortgage debt that 400 grand slowly diminishes and converts into this home equity line of credit and over that time frame you're bringing that out there and it's earning money for you and it's growing and that means that now you have tax, you have tax uh, incentives available that you wouldn't have had. So the more that you put yeah. out, the more that you and have. you're earning, you're earning more money, right? And you're, and you're converting more, yeah. that bad debt into good debt. And the more you cycle that money back, so as that income comes in, mm -hmm. uh, if it's rental income, if it's investment income, you can actually further the cycle, right? So you can prepay that mortgage take more money out, create a bigger tax deduction for yourself that's nested, that's going to be cool. there forever, right? Yeah. And you bring it back out and reinvest. And you keep that cycle going. And for most people, if you can actually get that cycle going and be pretty efficient with it, you can actually convert your mortgage from being like non-deductible to tax deductible, so bad debt to good debt. Sure, yeah. Within six seven years is, is and the so you're average. using this money that you've put out the, the, the what you're saying you know you you invest in things that pay you back cash the idea of course would be that then you would be paying because that money that you've taken out there's going to be interest on that money that you need to repay so the assumption would be that whatever you've invested in would pay you back cash so you can pay that interest right or well if you structure this properly yeah. it shouldn't ca cost you anything a month oh really yeah, yeah. The home equity line of credit itself, as it's opening up more and more principal to you, mm -hmm. you sh you'd be able to use the home equity line of credit to actually pay for itself. Oh, okay. So that's that's a huge component to this, because you don't necessarily have to change your lifestyle per se. You know, right? Because um, well, you don't need to pay be, anything back because you're getting it. Could be capulated, right? You can you can keep it in a capsule. Right. And it could pay for itself. And that is such a key component. A lot of people have a hard time wrapping their mind around that. Um, yeah, because I'm thinking about it. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm taking money out of the house. That money then is being put somewhere to invest and hopefully with a return of some kind. But what is happening to 
the fact that the bank has just now advanced this money to me. I've taken it out. They're going to want to get repaid back for that money that I've taken out. Correct? Well, they want to get paid their interest. Yeah, that's what I mean. So you're, you're <laughs> that's paying, what they want. <laughs> you're still paying interest. So you're, you'd be paying mm-hmm. interest on it. Mm-hmm. But you you uh, you would be making... you would you sh- The assumption would be is you didn't take that and buy... A fancy ass motor, you know, whatever. Yeah, like generating more income. You took you took that to generate income by buying an investment yes. that generates something, generates cash of some kind. Exactly, exactly. So what what would happen is over time, the um, the the portfolio investments is generating more and more and more income. Interesting, right? And so let's say you max this out, right? So now it's six hundred and fifty thousand dollars all in this home equity line of credit. Your portfolio has now grown to, you know, let's say one point two million dollars because it's like you know twenty years down the road. Sure. Um, and you have all this income coming in, right? Uh, you'll have enough money to service that six hundred fifty thousand dollars and then some. So that's sort of the the end game. That's the word service. Yeah, service. The end those game. Yeah. The end game is to generate and buy enough assets of generating all this income for you different income stream buckets that are coming in and you'll have enough to pay and service this loan and and live off some of it. Right. So that's sort of like when you're thinking about it in retirement, like how do I, you know, what happens later in life? Like maybe I can do this for a while, but what's the end game? That's the end game. Now, some people are like, well, you know, what do I, let's say I want to get rid of this debt finally, right? Mm -hmm. You got a couple options. So the first option that I suggest doing is, you know, it's, it's pretty simple. Like, don't get rid of it. Keep it. Keep the tax deduction for you, right? And have a life insurance policy in place so that, you know, it can wipe out any debts after death. Oh, right? this is just like you and any kind of policy. You're saying, like, doesn't matter. As you know, insurance brokers are always trying to sell you, like, a whole life policy, et cetera. Well, Does well, that matter? The cheapest way to go in is obviously a term life, right? And you can get up to 20 years in Canada, Right. Um, they usually sell 10, 15, 20. And that's the cheapest way. At the end of the 20 years, yeah. if you're in a great position, right? You shouldn't need life insurance. Right? Well, what that you that could do sense. even is convert that to a whole life at that point as well. Oh. Right? Yeah. Um, so what I mean by great position is if you've done really well with these investments and you just kept on going with the strategy, you can afford whatever this insurance policy is, sure. right? Um, so that's a strategy. If you own a couple properties... And we're 20 years down the road. Another thing you can simply do is maybe sell one of them, use the proceeds, pay off the loan. Sure. It would have grown in equity, hopefully, yeah. over that time. Yeah, and, the, and that loan would have went down as well, right? Right, yeah. So, and this is this is like, this is the power of owning assets, right? This is sort of like, you know, when, when people talk about risk, I always have the conversation of, well, if you don't do something, right? If you don't get proactive here, then what you're risking is is not having any flexibility later. Right. Right? Like you're sort of instilling whatever level of lifestyle you have right now minus a certain amount because your income is going to go down. That's what, you, that's what you're guaranteeing by doing zero. Right. Your income is all that you're relying on. Yeah, exactly. Versus... Exactly. And when you retire, that income is going to go down. So your lifestyle minus is what, what you're locking in if you don't do anything at all. Right. right? People want to talk about risk, though, right? So why don't we just address that very quickly? Like, tell me, like, what, what other is there? Is there are there other risks with respect to doing this? So if you do it, what can happen? Like in terms of a I risk? I think it's the nature. And of, how can you guard against that? Like you know, right, right. I think I think it's the nature of the investments that you're actually investing in. The mortgage end of it, it is tied to your house. So, I mean, you know, as far as it, it's the you could less it. least riskiest type of loans you can get in the market. Right, the cheapest generally is home equity line of credit, and then on top of that, um, it's uh, you know it's securitized to your house. I mean, so like you can always downsize <laughs> if you really wanted to pay sure. off the loan. So I mean, as far as like a sense of risk on the loan side, uh, you know, you're, you're not dealing with a loan shark. It's the cheapest, in, you know, as far as you can get. It's securitized to an asset that you own, so you know you don't necessarily. Um, have a lot of risk there where the risk comes into play is is are you generating enough income are you investing in something that's worth it 
Now, most people will do that. That's not usually the problem with someone that wants to engage and actually do the Smith maneuver. Um, it's the type of investment that you put it in. Uh, people's favorite investments is real estate. I, I mean, I think we, you and I both know and agree on that. Um, there's other investments too, right? The stock market has inherently different risks than, let's say, um, buying into a REIT, which is a, a real estate income trust. Right. Um, and, and so that those are really good. I like those a lot. Uh, mix or another one, uh, mortgage income corps. So that's where you would take your money. I like those types of investments. Put it into this mic, and then the mic does what? It lends the money. You know, for the record, I, you know, I I put it in in all three of those products. Okay, so like the stock market isn't awful. Like you want to <clears> buy <throat> quality stocks and and that generate income. the The whole point is income driven type of investments are are what is preferred. And the stocks know, that drive income, you mean like dividends are paid back? Yeah, exactly. Your right? typical blue chips, financials are great at that. Energy stocks, for example. Um, you know, I'm just giving you personal experience, by the way, I'm not advising you, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't have that license. Uh, but, uh, these are some th things that I personally do. Um, yeah. and, and I think it's important to have that diversity. Just don't go into one single thing or one single company. Uh, it's really good to have some diversity in, in your portfolio. That's how you mitigate risk in general. Um, and, and I, what I like about, uh, specifically about, uh, the REITs and the um, the mortgage income corps is that you know you're making rental income from one right. The REIT will pay out your portion or share like as it, just like a dividend uh, for whatever they're re generating revenue from. Um, the mix, the mortgage income corps, they're actually basically big private uh, equity firms that are, you're giving some money to, and they actually do private lending and things like that. Um, on all different types of you know projects, different assets too, right? Not different just, not assets. just real estate, right? Yeah, exactly. Like it might be commercial versus residential. Uh, some could be development. So they'll diverse. They'll inside their own company will diversify that uh, as well to mitigate risk as well, right? So these are all going to have a, a, a return. Uh, the REITs and the mix I really love because they typically most of them will pay monthly. Okay. Right, yeah, so, so that's that keeps nice. You on schedule, yeah, that's it keeps good. it keeps you going. It keeps you motivated. It's sure. nice to see something drop in your bank account, you know. Yeah, and it's sort of taking like you know once you start to replace income. So the question then is like, okay, how much do I need to replace before I can think about cutting down my hours at work or working somewhere else, working where I do doing a passion versus not, right? Well, I mean that's the beauty of actually pulling this off is that, you know, every Canadian can do this if you own a home and have a mortgage, right? And it's not hard, you're saying. It's, it's not it's not hard. I mean, it's just the action of actually doing it and take advantage of it. And that's your end goal. Like, we all want to get to a space where I'm generating enough revenue. I maybe have a small pension from work. Maybe not, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you got your CPP and your OAS. I mean, that's basically survival, right? Um, and you, then you have like maybe you got a little pension from work. So so you go from like levels of retirement. It could be like survival. If you do nothing and you didn't have a bad job that didn't offer you any sort of like incentive savings plan, then you're going to be in survival mode once you get to those retirement years. If you um, have something, you know, in place from work and you have your CPP and your OAS, you know, if you're not doing anything outside of that, you're gonna just have, um, you know, a comfortable sure. sort of sort of like it's comfortable. Like maybe you got, you know, maybe maybe you can afford a new car in your retirement, maybe, but it's gonna be like a Ford, you know, it's not gonna be, <laughs> it ain't gonna be a Mercedes, okay, or a Lexus, um, and then maybe you can, you know, take a trip once a year. Judging right? Fords, come on now, Rob. Come I on. love Fords, <laughs> but they are a little more affordable than you know, um, a Lexus or a Mercedes, right? Um, but then, you know, this is where when we step up. So if you actually get active here, this is where anyone can bring themselves to the next level and have a much more comfortable and desire, a desirable um, uh, retirement. Because this is where, you know, you have different income streams coming in on top of maybe what work was kind of set you up with, if it's good or bad. Um and then, of course, the survival stuff, right? The yeah. CPP that comes in, we're all entitled to. And if you get that going on, then you sort of have this like yippee ki sort of retirement, right? 
You can afford a new car and it's nice. You can afford to maybe bring the family out on a Disney cruise, you know, sure. like stuff like that. Like those little enhancements in your lifestyle can happen, you know, because that's the biggest fear I think most people have when it comes to retirement is at some point you wake up. If it isn't in your 40s, it definitely happens in your 50s where you're like, OK, yeah, I'm going to one day not be doing this anymore. Um, did I do enough now? Did I save enough to get me through these years? Because no, everyone, I think, wants to stop working in their 60s. Um, and the truth is... If, Most people don't, don't they? The truth is, it's not an option for a lot of people that's because true, yeah. they didn't do enough, right? So, <clears throat> And that's what I think people got to really keep in mind when, when we start talking about using your mortgage as an asset, stop thinking of it as a burden, that this is what we're saying is like, hey, you can expand yourself and your lifestyle over time. You know, it doesn't have to be a burden. It doesn't have to be like <laughs> making you feel shackled. It should be an actual um, a gift to you, really. Right. Because, uh, you know, remember, how much did you put down for your first house? The first house you ever bought, how much money did you put down, do you think? Uh, actually, I think I remember I doing your mortgage, actually. You I just did. I mean, we did. We put down... Oh my God, we put down, but we borrowed money too, right? We we borrowed money for right. family. So okay. we had like, you know, our own money, which was like 200 grand or something. And then we had some family money, like 300 grand, right? So Ryan was pretty lucky. So I, 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 right? we, had, I we were helpful. It was very helpful. Like, right. but like we, they, it was helpful and they were worried because more, like properties were so expensive and we weren't going to move out of the city. So they're like, well, okay, you can, we'll lend you this money. Right. Right. And that's what happened. They lent us whatever they lent us. Uh, they lent us a little less than that. It was a gift. Sixty grand or something. <laughs> it became a gift after. It became right? a gift. We were, but we were paying it off up until yeah. you and I had that last conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So I, you know, it was very helpful. Uh, we couldn't have done it without them, to be honest. Not right. Not by in the neighborhood that we did, close to where everybody is, where we needed to be. You and know? I think that's great. You know, your family were trying to support you guys staying nearby. And they obviously love you. I mean, that was the reason why, right? Yeah. But, you know, I could tell you, like, our they love down my payment. Grand. They love my kids. They don't love me. <laughs> they love my kids. They're like, you got to keep those kids here. So, you know, we'll do what we need to do. Get you. Keep, keep, keep you close. <laughs> hey, well, thank God you had them. Right? <laughs> you <know? Yeah. laughs> um but you know, I'll I speak. wouldn't have needed a house probably, to be honest, if I didn't have the kids. You know, we have that, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, it's a whole other right? conversation. Getting married it's and having children <laughs> it's a definitely is a lifestyle shift. It's a reality, um, yeah. especially for men, right? But uh, for myself, right, we we put down like thirty thousand dollars, right? It was basically just a little bit from her RSP and my RSP bought our first place, right? But over time. We, you know, I essentially learned that this was such an important thing. Like, you know, this is how you grow wealth, right? It's it's this mortgage and the value of your property going up. Like, this is such a key component. Now, most people, I would say 80% of Canadians think their goal is to pay down their mortgage and then start saving a little bit on the side. If I could save a little bit here and there on the way to that journey, great. But priority is that every extra dollar I have in my cash flow is going to go to pay to pay down my mortgage, right? Okay. Yep. So you know, if you're really efficient, you know, you can maybe do that within 15 years. So 15 years goes by, and all of a sudden you're like, okay, I'm going to start saving, right? So now you start saving. Maybe you're shelling away 10 grand a year. So you're letting that compound over time. Uh, but you started 15 years down the road, right? Now, if I did that, there's no way I would have been in the position I'm in now, right? Because what I did was the reverse, right? I, I said, okay, property values started going up. Fantastic. I had a bit of extra money. I'm like, great. This is what I'm going to do. I took out a bunch of money and I started buying other properties. Right. This was right as you got the house. Well, this is as like you know the first the first five years uh, when you buy a house, especially if you're a first time buyer and you put a minimum down. Yeah, what you're really doing is is building up to that stage, right? Yeah, I'm thinking back. I feel like we didn't even do like we had maybe sixty grand or something saved, and then we yeah. had we had yeah we had help and it was a mortgage, so we were paying that back. But like yeah. you know, like 
I feel uh, I feel like that that first stage of buying a home, you learn a lot, right? Yeah, I it's mean, yeah, discovery you learn, time. You learn a ton about yeah. like, oh, this is how <laughs> this is how expensive it is to actually buy a house, especially in this market. This is adulting, yeah. So, and and that's that's the thing, right? So, what what we did um, is we said, okay, let's get some money out there, right? Let's actually take some cash out and put it out to the world. Uh, we started buying properties. Uh, we we bought pre construction, and what that turned out to be was uh, a blessing. So even though we were increasing our debt load overall, right? Um, what we what we did is actually create opportunity for ourselves later, right? And this is where I really say it's important to master your cash flow, because once you get into the space. You don't want to unwind the situation, right? And so that's what eventually drove me to become a cash flow specialist and eventually a mortgage broker hmm. was just saying, hey, like, I know the name of the game. You know, these banks are just like making money out of thin air. Like, I want a piece of that. Yeah. And I'm going to go buy a bunch of stuff that's actually worth something. Right. But I know? Think, And that's the thing is like people don't know your story. Yeah. You weren't always a mortgage broker, right? Like, no, no, that's true. Yeah. yeah. No, I had you, at the time we're not, right? You were you were No, I was a paramedic actually. Yeah. So I had like, you know, a public service job, uh, you know, working all kinds of crazy hours. Uh our kids were born. Right. And kids being born into your life is like an atomic bomb in your cash flow planning, right? Like yeah. it just goes and and what ends up happening for most people myself included me and my wife we just are like suddenly like like i got more money going out than i got coming in mm -hmm. and you know when you're going through that early stages of being parents when there's maternity paternity leave going on maybe you had an nest egg kind of saved up probably didn't most of us don't right um that's what happens right so you end up drumming up a little more debt so that's when i thought there has to be a better way, right? Because I know I make decent money. Even after my wife went back to work, you know, we we had expenses, uh, like childcare expenses. Sure. Uh, I think you're going through that stage of the game oh, now, right? Oh, 100%. Yeah, and it's, it's not cheap, it's, I know. It's tough. It's, it's tough, it's tough, right? It's I mean, very tough. It's easier for someone like me. I can, I can adjust my income to make it so that we can, we can hit, right? Yeah. right? I mean, we can do what we can, but I mean, I can't, it's not unlimited. <laughs> it's not like, you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. So we, you know, we live as much as we can within our means now and try to do that. Uh, man, I'll tell you, it's still not, I'm not perfect with it right now. I'll tell you, I'm still like, I'm still already, I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to track this line of credit amount that I'm going to have to pay back this credit card with, yeah. you know what I mean? And it's like, uh, we had a trip planned. We weren't going to cancel that trip. Because we looked at our finances and decided, a, hey, oh no, we're we're gonna cancel the trip. It's like no, the trip was planned. We're gonna do it now. That means okay, now we're gonna have to figure out a way to get that debt back to where you're right. Get that debt erased. The only way really for me to do that is to just say, well, I guess I'm gonna pay myself more money. I'm gonna have to try and work harder at practicing law to get more money down down the. I'll pot. send you a few more deals. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> we'll send you a few more closings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, okay, so that's just it. Okay, so you gave a prime example of the consciousness you need to have. Yeah. Right? Because life, life is real. Like, that's what's wrong with budgeting. It's always like looking backwards and saying, how can I organize right. what happened? Like, who cares, right? You got to deal with forward thinking Cash flow planning. What are we going to do? About is this? really prime yeah. for that, right? It, it's about the flow. Like the key word is flow, right? Having that flow move you forward and build the consciousness of right. Okay, well, you know what? It's important for us to go on that trip, right? And I always say this: a wise man once told me, sometimes you can't afford not to go on a vacation. That's right. True. Especially in those younger years where like it's tough. You know, <laughs> like you're if you're not going bald, you're like really pulling the, your hair out, right? It's really tough. So like you gotta go, you gotta need you gotta get some release, right? That's life in the fast paced world that we live in. Um, the kids are always gonna have needs, you know. Uh, if it's diapers one day, it's swimming the next, then it's soccer, it's hockey, it's dance, it's like you name it, right? So there's always things that you're um, making a priority and it's just the consciousness of actually saying, Hey, we bring in so much. This is the money that we're going to use to live off of. This is the money that's going to move us forward. And the idea is get more life out of that cash. See, where can we find more opportunity? 
So I only bring that and interject that into this because it was such a pivotal moment for myself. Like you know? buying the house. I had a home. Having the kids. I was like, I realized money is is available for us to grow wealthier. I, you know, basically said, let's do it. So kid, a house, marriage and house kind of happened at the same time. Kids comes in the picture. I'm like, I need to build more wealth and build more opportunity. So we, we borrow because house equity goes up. So I'm feeling great right now. But at the same time, I'm like, man, there's a lot going on here, right? Like... There's a lot of moving, a lot of moving parts. It wasn't like when, you know, Carolyn and I were were just starting off, and we just had like, you know, we didn't have to worry about fun money because there was always enough, sure. and you know, things were okay, right? Like, you know, we saved at the end of the month, you know, put yeah. some aside. Well, there's only you and her spending. Yeah, right? you know, it's nothing, right? Yeah, Easily. exactly. So all of a sudden, you had to put a real level of consciousness around that, and that was such a pivotal moment because once that happened, we were able to actually build more planning for savings, right? And that's actually evolved into learning how to do the Smith Maneuver. And now that has elevated into different types of investments, different income streams. Right. You know, buying insurance, for example, is such an important part of your financial plan. Yeah. Right? And so you can get basic coverage, super important. If you don't have basic coverage- I got coverage, basic coverage. I got you term insurance right now. Basic coverage. You just need it because- I don't have I don't have disability, though. That's one thing that I don't if have. If you're self-employed, I will say this, disability coverage is, is a priority. It may even be a bigger priority than even life coverage, to be honest with you. It's something you should consider because interesting, yeah. Because disability replaces your income, and if you got a job, usually they'll have some sort of coverage for you. But if you um, if you don't like, if you're self employed, then you know that's the if end. the well dries up, yeah. So having disability coverage will will literally make those um, mortgage payments uh, for you, right? So it's it's super important, uh, I think. Um, and then you know that that. <laughs> You know, life insurance, man, it's it's a whole other ball game. Uh, but that's how you elevate, right? So, you know, life insurance, for example, now like I have uh, a few infinite banking systems where I have a ULI cash, sure, cash, yeah. uh, um, where I'm building up a cash deposit in there and it's earning and I can reborrow it later. So it's like stuff like that. It comes from proper cash flow planning, building up income streams, using the Smith Maneuver to your advantage, and it's it's a mindset. Yeah, it's a total that's, that's, mind shift. Is there tips for getting people on the mindset? Because I really think mindset and then also for people who wreck it. I mean, look, it's hard. It's easy to fall off that wagon, right, as well, right? And getting back on it, you know, in, are there tips you can you can suggest for keeping people on it? And if they fall off, getting their mindset back into doing it again, you know? Because, you know, people just be like, ah, Fuck it. I'm just going to, I'm going, I'm going on five occasions. I don't care. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, for sure. Because it's frustrated. It gets sure. frustrated. COVID, COVID was a great example. You know, that. especially like people, right? Like in terms of the income, if the income is very tight and you can't do anything about it, right? You just sort of like, you give up on it. Well, I think, I think what you said is key actually. Yeah. The key to it is, is to just have short-term goals that are super fun that will keep you motivated. Paying off debt is not a short-term goal. That's a long-term goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A short-term goal has to be there to keep the juices flowing because there's going to be days, right? You pay yourself every week, right? And you, you're like, all right, this is the amount of money we need to kind of like get going, right? Um, we're going to we're gonna spend that on food, entertainment this week. Uh, you know, J little Johnny needs a new pair of sneakers and, you know, little Sarah has a birthday party on Friday, right? So we're, we're figuring out life as it comes up. You have a little pot of cash that you're just allowed to blow on things right but there's gonna be a point where it's gonna be yeah we don't have enough right and then you got to decide what's what do we really need maybe this week right and it's so when those moments come up there's two things that need to happen you just have to recognize that um that you know you're paying yourself week to week there's a reason why we keep it nice and short like that when you're cash flow planning is that it's seven days, all right? It's seven days. So you got to wait two more days. It's not a big deal. You can delay that gratification if we want to, right? Sure. So it's easy to make tougher decisions like that. I think the other big thing with the short-term goals is that, you know, 
if it is a bigger decision, you know, like, hey, you know, should we should we do that weekend away right now and, and take away from us saving for that European vacation we've been eyeing for the last like 12 months? We're almost there. I almost have enough. I could book it and we could be there in three months. Mm -hmm. But if I if, if we go away to Niagara, which you've been to like 100 times just because, you know, whatever, right, whatever, you know, frustration you might have in the moment. Uh, it might take away from that. Wow. I mean, I'm picking Europe over or Niagara all day yeah, long, right? Sure. So I think short term goals are super important and they got to be fun. They got to keep you motivated and it's got to keep you and your partner thinking along the same lines and, and just having open, honest conversations is probably the, the other big tip, you know? Yeah. Um, being real with each other, you know, like I, I really need this or I really want that. Um, you know, can we, how can we make that work, right? And make it work with them, right? There's things that are going to be super important to to you uh, that may not be super important to your partner, right? So, but you know, it's it, we're not talking about um, constricting, right? It's all about having. It's all about like, yeah, like spend this money. Let's do it. It's it's being positive. So those are the things that are, are really big and key. It's just figuring out how ways to do that and, and being honest about it. Yeah. And and stay keeping yourself motiv motivated with short term goals. And 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 not yeah, yeah, like it's, it's like impulse control. <laughs> like some of it, right? Yeah. And of you're like you say it you say it in a way that's so positive, but you know, it's like being like, No, fuck that. You can't have that right now. You just gotta wait. <laughs> you know what I mean? You gotta wait. You want your cottage, you want your boat. You want the boat and then you got the, you know, it's like you, were, you said that to me once. You said, you know, that's what happens. Like people get the thing, they get the cottage and they think, oh, well, I got the cottage. Like I need the boat and I need the, you know, oh, we need the jet skis. Oh, we need this. And it's like all of a sudden, you know, maybe you could have afforded the cottage. And now you've got things you can't afford. And you did that without really thinking about it. So this kind of planning that you're doing helps with that kind of impulse to want to yeah, no, no. At the very least, it gets it's going to curve your temperament it. of it, right? Like, yeah. like, like you know, it will it will help you keep your frame of mind a little more linear versus so sporadic, right? Yeah, <laughs> I remember it was a Boxing Day, actually, just this past, and I needed a new pair of gym sneakers, and I was shopping online, and so it's like, all right, cool, found these, great time, love buying stuff on sale, like I'm just, I love a deal, right? Yeah, yeah. So I buy my new sneakers pair of nikes great deal cool right put it in my add to cart and then there's these other reeboks you know i'm like <laughs> yo look at these kicks right why just super like them right they're on sale they're even better price I'm like maybe i should get those right but i was like you know what do i really need them like i already have a white little pair of sneakers that i bought in the summer and they're fine they're great like like what am i gonna do with these i'm never gonna wear them right? sure but the moment those moments come up. I that's what I tend to think about. I'm like, well, okay, if I do that, then you know, I, I, I'm not I'm not going away, right? Like we Something. had a trip just about lined up. It's like I'm not I'm not thinking about that. You know, I need this because you know my my sneakers were looking awful. I, I was embarrassed to wear them at the gym anymore. So you need so something. Like, yeah. I need some. I got these great shoes. I should be happy about those. I got the money to pay for that, but I don't need a second pair. I don't care what the deal is, right? Mm -hmm. And and that those are the moments you stop yourself. Uh, by simply just saying, hey, you know, like, think about your long, your short term goal. I'm thinking about the beach, right? All of a sudden, you're like, hey, yeah, yeah, okay, cool. And so it's like curbing that 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 temperament for a second, like saying, hey, you know, yeah, it's getting you thinking, just kind of on the yeah, yeah. And, and it has short. to be something fun because you know what's not going to stop me from buying that second pair of sneakers. Oh, I got to pay down my debt. Like, bam, bam, bam. like yeah. that's a bummer, <laughs> right? Like, no one. So it's got to be something juicy, right? And the thing is, do it. Like, don't kid yourself. Don't trick yourself. Like, save up for it. Book it. Go, right? Sure. And it's not always trips. Like, you know, I have uh, a client I work with who hates going away. He's a total, like, tech uh, guy, right? And so he wants, like, you know, some crazy computer. I don't know what it is, right? This is not my my thing. But, um, you know, like, that was his goal. His short-term goal was, like, I'm going to buy the the machine, you know? It costs a ton of money. I'm buying the machine though. And so like that's how he curbed it. And like and everyone's gonna have something. Yeah, I'll buy the machine. So that's yeah. motivating him to be like, I'm not gonna buy this stupid pair of shoes. Or I'm not gonna yeah, exactly, it. right? Like all of a sudden, like, you know, you're making smarter decisions because and you know, you have that on your mind. 
And sure enough, he actually bought the machine. He sent me a picture of it. I didn't know what it was. I'm like, yeah, man, sound, looks like a great laptop, you know. But <laughs> but he was happy and excited about it, you know. And, and I'm and I was so glad to see him achieve that goal. And that is also very very um, lucrative for yourself, like actually getting to that six month point, that twelve month point, and you're there, or yeah. you have it. You did it for yourself. That's training your mind. Like you're just flowing all kinds of melatonin, serotonin. Like you're feeling good. You know yeah. that that's your your drug kick, right? Um, because you did do it, you know, and you're feeling good about that. And that I could tell you right now from a marriage perspective, man, that is such a booster too between um, you and your partner. Is like, hey, we did this together. Like, look, we're on this cruise, man. Look at like we're feeling the wind in our like we did that. You know, and then so when you're then you get home and you're like, all right, well, what's our next goal? Yeah. What's keeping us going? Right. So it's very much a game of psychology that is absolutely positive. It's about training yourself to pay yourself first and keep yourself motivated to live within your means and and doing it in a way that's it's doable. Right. It's doable. Right. It's. So it, I always, you know, fray, you know, people are like, is it a budget? I'm like, no, it's not a budget, man. <laughs> this is like, it know, is initially like some of it is budgeting. Some of it's budgeting, right? Yes. We're talking. I think, I think the similarities with budgeting is when you get started, right? You, you have to account for what's going on. Yeah. That's, that's really where the similarities come into play. Right. And then from there, that's where the, the plan gets born. Right. That's where your motives and, you know, the, some dollar amounts get thrown around. But outside of that, like literally there's nothing else that's around that because budgeting just, again, it just tells you this is what happened in the past and, you know, okay, maybe I'll just try this. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. There's no real planning around it. You're just sort of having a view sure. of what, what you've done or didn't do. Right. Right. Um, and so I think, I think there's, you know, a big difference there um, in that sense. Right. You know? Interesting. Interesting. I feel like it's very, it's, it's super insightful. I mean, you can't do it by yourself. That's the other thing that's important to keep in mind. Or like, you know, if you've got someone else in your life, you've got kids, you got your family, you really should be on the same page with that person, right? In certain respects, or at least you guys have similar goals. No, I think so. Absolutely. I mean, this is the, this is the kind of stuff will, will get you on the same page. You know, get like, you on the same. Yeah. They're thinking about this. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. It gets you on the same page. You guys can speak the same language. Um, we talked, I think, about last week about having different bank accounts, yeah, and stuff like that. And I and I and and um, you know, I think it works really well when you do have, you know, like a common account um, that you you use. If it's easier, have separate accounts. I mean, all you have to do is just make sure everyone kind of knows what they're responsible for, right? Like, yeah, I mean, I feel like we don't have we just, we don't have the same account. Like, we have one general account for most of the expenses, but we still have separate accounts, which eh, maybe that means that we need two cash flow plans, right? Kind of. It could mean that. Out. I think w what you would really do in that situation is the cash flow plan you have is then now say, okay, you know, we have so much that we're going to pay ourselves every week. Um, why don't you take, you know, 75% of it because you're going to probably, you know, be the one that gets the groceries and, um, you know, uh, you know, picks up the gifts or clothes for the kids. I'll take that little chunk, right? Uh, the, the other twenty five percent, and uh, I'll make plans for the weekend, right? You know what I mean? And like, I think that that's what it's about, right? That's how you guys stay on the same page. Is just be okay with with that kind of you know way of operating. Um, if you do that, listen, it's not about perfect. It's like zero. Like none of this is about perfect, right? It's always about doing it. Just get it going. Because there's going to be some weeks you're going to be absolutely amazing at it. And there's going to be other weeks where, man, things kind of went off the rails, right? <laughs> but yeah. it's about actually being conscious of it. Yeah. Because the problem is with most people, they don't have a clue what's good and what's bad. They just know things ain't right. Right. Right? And so it's the idea of the framework. Like, hey, you know. We should be going like that. There's going to be times you're doing going above, you're going, you know, below. But the idea is that you're still going that way, right? I think that's, I think, I think that's that's the the key part of that. It's it's interesting. I mean, I I think you need to do the plan, though. Somebody has to help you with that plan. Like you know, 
people should contact you for that if you want to tell people about how they can do that. Because I, I think that's really key. I mean, I don't think we could have gotten there without, first of all, I know you say it isn't about it, but that initial step of like, okay, what is it that we need to cover? And then, hey, let's plan for the future. That sounds easy. It sounds like, oh, I'll just do that. But I don't, a lot of people don't have that education. You know, they don't grow up in an environment where people teach them that. <laughs> I didn't anyway, even even though, you know, I didn't come from nothing. I came from like a pretty, a pretty you know, upper middle class, middle class family who could afford to help me. But they couldn't convert that information into something that, you know, information about wealth that would help me grow my wealth and like, you know, become self-sufficient. So, you know, a lot of that I learned from you. And I think I'm not the only kind of. I'm not the only people, people, a person in this kind of cohort where we've got, you know, yes, we, we needed some help. We got that help, but we didn't have the education piece to grow our wealth even further, you know? So I think it would be, you know, I think it's, it's useful to have a cash flow plan in place. It's very, very helpful, you know? Yeah. I think education is what it's about. You nailed it right on the head. Right. Yeah. Like we simply in school never learned this. We just didn't. No, we don't. Was... You know, I went I went to college for business and men in finance <laughs> and I took personal financial planning courses in college, got a diploma, you know, and everything of that. And there was never a word about you know, how to manage money. Like not how to invest it, not like that all that stuff is a different story. Sure. This is like how to operate, right? Not a single thing, you know. And, uh, you know, so strange, I, I grew up like most people, yeah, middle-class family, you know, um, and they had the same attitudes, uh, that we were talking about before where debt is, um, yeah, debt is, is, is so that's bad, bad right. <clears throat> and so it took, it took a lot of, um, willingness to kind of, uh, get, uh, educated myself. Okay. And I feel like it, it happens partially on purpose like i don't know you know like you see all that you you often hear that right like if you're watching reels and stuff there's always guys spilling out like they made you dumb for a reason like the banks are taking advantage of all of us you know they didn't teach you this in school right uh, i think there's truth to that you know um you. and you know at the end of the day it doesn't matter right like once you kind of know you know like so actually start doing it like the biggest part for all of this is taking action Right. And so what I offer is um, the cash flow planning and implementation advice. So I helped you, you yep. know, gave you advice on actually how to implement sure. this. Right. Yep. Um, and then uh, as well as the Smith maneuver, uh, same thing, it's introducing you to it and uh, it helping you implement it and get it going um, with either. They're both different processes, uh, but they generally start with the fact that we're going to gather information. Uh, figure out what some of your goals are. And then from there, we're going to implement uh, a, an action plan. For the cash flow planning, it's a little more, I think, dive it into um, around your goals mm -hmm. and how are we going to get you there and keep you motiv motivated. There's a little more strategy, I think, around that as far as that part of things and the psychology around it. The Smith Maneuver, most people, once they get turned on to it, they're, they just go on Google, right? They're watching, like, you know, Robinson Fra uh, Frazier, uh, sorry, Robinson Smith is is uh, the guy who's the namesake to the Smith Maneuver. It's actually his father, okay. right? Frazier okay. Smith. And Robinson sort of took it over from him. Um, and he, you know, he updated the book, right? Because there's a book. So everyone, there's lots of education components there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> like you yeah. could just, you know, go nuts and watch and watch and watch. So the Smith Maneuver... Um, what I do is I help people sort of implement it and get it going right? because it's a little more um, heavy on the implementation implementation sure. side. Right. Do you have the right mortgage? If not, okay, we set you up with that. Right. If uh, then there's the whole like movement of money and the bank accounts and it just educating you and get you competent and confident and comfortable with like just rolling with this cool. and getting it going. So I'm sort of like, you know, um, boot camping, people into to getting this done nice yeah that's what that's what i do and then 
Um, you're gonna do. You're gonna. You're gonna talk. You'll. You'll. You'll put some stuff out. Some more content out about. Yeah. Well, that's about what. That. That's, that's what a lot of this is about. I mean, I think you know, like specifically about boot camping. I mean, right? Like, yeah. You're, you're gonna create some stuff there. Um. I. I've, I think. Look, we're, we're gonna have. I know that we're getting a bit of a wrap up single. I think. I think that we we can continue this conversation. It can be a bigger one about the Smith maneuver. Maybe you dive deeper into that. Yeah. Specifically. Um. But listen. Uh. You know, it's been great. Sitting down again, we're going to continue to do this, educate Absolutely. the people. They can know more about me, more about you. And, you know, uh, you know, again, it's, you know, on the legal side, you can look for me, Ryan, the property lawyer online, Ryan Martin. And we've got Roberto P Palaccia here educating us on the mortgages. We're going to continue to do that. And we're going to think of we're going to try and get some guests on for our next uh, few episodes. So thanks for tuning in, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for listening.